uh, which is managed by the University of Washington uh, to study uh, salmon migrations, basically, and they introduce uh, different strains, genetic strains of salmon into the river to study them. And a friend of mine was there uh, doing his PhD work, and uh, we set up these cameras to record the, uh, the migration of salmon, basically moving up through the river. And as you can see what it is, the whole field of images takes a length of river, photographing straight down to the surface of the river, captures the fish moving from one film frame to the next film frame to the next film frame. And uh, you find yourself standing in a room it's about 25 meters long, 30 meters long, this sort of body of the stream. And then you're there next to this river with this event happening in front of you. Uh, and what's of interest about this when you record it with film, uh, and this is true in general, but it also relates back to my idea about there's more information in front of us than we acknowledge. Uh, the, by slightly changing the film timing, uh, the longer you look at it, there's like another field of information within the film. And after you look at it for a period of time, you're not just watching the salmon within the water, but there's a field of information on the surface, which is a perfect image of the sky overhead. And then, of course, through the water, what's below it. So a lot of, a lot of ways, I sort of think of that stream as being a, uh, a metaphor for glass. I mean, you have the reflected information on the surface, a content within the, within the material, and then another field of information beyond it. So these types of film installations were really a way of uh, exploring events in nature and like how you represent those events in nature and what that quality of light is or that experience. And then this is made many years later, this is about 10 years later, uh, taking that same, I only use this from the, point of, from the perspective that this is actually taking one film that was made out of maybe 25 and one project that are directly related amongst other projects, but this is a glass bridge uh, that was commissioned uh, as, a, as a, basically almost sort of like artwork, but it's a, a glass bridge. We're, look, we're looking at the plan view here, plan view of this uh, stream uh, glass platform is supported from opposite sides of the shore. Uh, you walk out of the platform, and for a moment in time there, your passage is not necessarily going over the river, but you're actually participating in the movement of the river itself. So there's a moment in time when you're more actively engaged in that particular ecology, and uh, the light coming down, hitting the surface of the river, reflecting back up, that bridge is in fact glass, it's sort of cast glass, uh, and then carries with it sort of the information of light uh, projected on the surface of the material. So it's just like a little video that tries to uh, simulate what, what that event is like uh, in terms of uh, the movement of water. And uh, uh, I'm not sure why that shut off. It's a film uh, that sort of simulates what this bridge was like. It's a passage of uh, maybe it takes you a few moments to cross the river. Lights hitting the bottom of the, the surface of the river, reflecting back up to the underneath surface of the bridge. And there's a series of transparent panels in front of you that have a slight degree of reflectivity to it. So as you move through the bridge, each of those panels is reflecting a different view of the surrounding landscape. So you actually have, in a way, a cinematic experience of the surroundings. Uh, that you're passing through, presented by these transparent panels of glass. Uh, but structures like that, like this bridge, which you'll see, you'll see in a moment, uh, were really a way of transitioning many years later from uh, having studied architecture, gone into sort of the art world, uh, done these film projects for about eight or ten years, uh, which were shown pretty actively in New York and in Europe. Uh, and then sort of coming back to architecture through a desire to find smaller scale projects, uh, smaller scale projects where you could, uh, in fact, hold on to the conceptual idea of the film installations, but build works that people would experience and give them an opportunity to explore uh, events in nature in a different way. Um, so there we have it. Um, so we'll just let this run for a minute just to get an idea of these panels. But uh, this sort of brought me back to architecture. We were doing some smaller scale commissions like this. 
uh, for different individuals. Uh, and it sort of brought me back to wanting to move away from a gallery or museum environment where you have a very uh, sort of preconditioned audience that goes to museums or galleries and find a way that you could build things sort of in the public sphere uh, that would be uh, basically exposed to any, anybody moving down the street, whether you were a, a gallery or a museum enthusiast, you'd be exposed to some of these projects. So, uh, So it's about the same time, this is a project of that same time period, uh, which is using uh, dichroic glass or an interference coating glass. And uh, the project was really a, a very simple, it's a chapel uh, over this very beautiful landscape. And then the client for the, for the chapel, uh, sort of, the, sort of the, the, the priest, the head priest of the chapel, uh, wanted to uh, be certain, because it was in such a beautiful landscape, that there was an opportunity when you sat in the chapel, you'd have a, an obstructed view of the landscape beyond. So the window, the window is basically totally clear glass, uh, and it's about, uh, it's about 10 meters tall, a little over 10 meters tall, and then it's, it's subdivided in, with this, uh, with this dichroic glass in between, which is part of the structure. So what you're seeing is happening is obviously light coming down, a portion of the light's being reflected up, portion of the light is sort of transmitting down. So uh, the one thing that happens on projects like this uh, is that they, uh, most importantly, have a life to them. And that's always a little bit why I try to use videos when I can. But uh, it's something that would be there for a long period of time. You might walk into this chapel. You know, the wall looks sort of like this over here. It's a very neutral, like an overcast day, or like very, very subtle softness of this sort of in this case, or a graphic image, or you might just get fragmentary pieces of this image. You might also just something might pop, pop up here while the rest of it is uh, uh, not revealed to you. And then it also the whole thing appears, then it disappears, and of course, any month or day, it's always different as it moves through the space. And there's actually two of these windows. There's one, uh, one, one to this end, which is uh, sort of to the west, and then one to the, to the east. And they basically converge, the two images converge because, uh, because of the clear glass structure in here. You're getting one image that's projecting against the wall, but there's another image that's projecting back out as a reflection towards you. So it's actually projecting two different images. And they then converge on the opposite wall. It's really taking that exterior environment information, transposing it, and bringing it to the interior where you're observing it in a very abstract way, but nonetheless it has the richness of uh, time elements and shape and change and act activation of light. And uh, I think this notion of activation of light is uh, critical to how we experience light. That it's uh, a lot of times in daylighting, uh, or in terms of professional daylighting for uh, commercial spaces, you're trying to get very uniform, very even levels of light across a broad surface. Uh, and I think that's obviously a, a, a terrific goal, but it's also uh, very important, I think, that we see brightness, activation, irregularity, all these variables that are connected to light as we experience it in nature. How does that get brought into a built environment and uh, provide the sort of activation and excitement perceptually and sort of psychologically that we sort of need in buildings? So some of these projects try to you know, explore those ideas, and this is a, a small house done for a client uh, in Minneapolis, uh, and in fact, it's an elderly couple. They, they uh, commissioned this house when they were 70 years old, uh, and they've been living for the previous uh, 30 years in a really beautiful modern house outside of the city of Minneapolis with a lot of land around it, with an incredible art collection that was sort of given to the museum, the Walker Art Center, which is in Minneapolis, which is one of our better contemporary museums in the United States. Uh, and they wanted to live right in the city and live right near the museum where they donated their collection, but they wanted to feel like they lived back in the country where they used to live. So they wanted the house to be very private, even though you were in the city. Uh, and they, as they were elderly, they wanted a very open, very simple uh, plan for the house and the engagement with the landscape. So essentially bought two parcels of land and tore down the existing houses and then built this new house. Uh, and there's actually a, a window in particular here. We worked on 
all the windows. They have a little screening system to them. Uh, and this is with Vincent, Vincent James. And there's a, a window here uh, that's right up against the stone wall and a fence and another building. So we're, we're in a neighborhood. Uh, and this window uh, led up to their uh, living quarters or bedrooms upstairs. Uh, so they would walk by this window every morning and every evening and whenever they would go upstairs. Uh, so it's a window uh, effectively that has no view. So it's a, a window that's right up against the wall, like the window would be, say, yeah, where my hand is, and then there's actually a stone wall, wood fence, and another building. So looking out the window, there isn't really a view. You're just looking into these obstructions. So this little mock-up demonstrates, and we, we do a lot of work with mock-ups in our studio, but this just demonstrates what we're trying to do. This, is, this would be as if you're standing outside looking into the window. It's essentially a feel a lens system, then this is a piece of diffused glass. Uh, it's at a certain distance away from the lens, so the lens focuses on that glass. And then looking from the inside is what you get. It's actually the diffused piece of glass, and you can see that the lens is basically taking that horizon line back there, you see it up above here, and then the window view. Uh, so just taking that principle of a window basically being a periscope, uh, this is how you structure it. There's a series of mirrors outside, uh, that are angled in a 45 degree. The lens is set in front of the, that mirror. And then set in front of the lens is a piece of diffused glass. So the whole principle is you're taking whatever's directly overhead. You're taking the view of the sky directly overhead. You're bringing it down into the window plane. The mirror sees that sky image. The lens then interprets that sky image and then projects it against this piece of glass. So it's basically uh, a device which uh, takes all of the surrounding fragments of information that are it's real I and mean, it's actually what's happening outside the building it's not necessarily what's outside the window itself but it's taking fragments of the surrounding environment uh, treetops the sun movement leaves uh, and then during construction you can sort of see what it is you can see the obstructions outside but in the mirror you begin to see what we're looking at we're actually looking at the top of a tree uh, in the distance or the sky beyond that and then when you put in that final piece of glass uh, in front of the lenses, it turns into a field of basically like video monitors. So each image is, you know, maybe, uh, I don't know, whatever that would be, 20 inches, 18 inches square. Uh, and it's basically just real-time projection. That's, that's a real-time uh, projection of what's going on outside. That's the top of a tree and the sky beyond it. Uh, you're picking up some highlight. I don't exactly know what that bright spot is. But uh, there are certain times that like, you look at this window at night. Uh, this, this shows you the complexity of the image. Like here you're seeing a projection of the tree and the sky. And at the same time, you're getting some direct light that's revealing some of the structure and the optics uh, behind the image. Uh, and then you end up with this field. So it's taking, taking bits of information around you and presenting them at different scales. Uh, and uh, you can look at this at nighttime, like say in the winter, uh, you know, like there's a full moon or something. And you see like 80 images of the moon uh, in the window. So it's really a sort of an active, again, changing device uh, that one way you might, you might call it is it's almost like trying to create a new reality. It's like an augmented reality. It's, it's what's out there, but uh, it's a condition where you can construct a new, a new way of thinking about what your environment is or the ecology around you is. You sort of selectively create a new environment. Uh, from really very little information. Uh, this is a, a project down in Sydney, Australia, and it's a, a very different from the point of view that it works with daylight to create a threshold uh, to enter the Olympic Park down in the Sydney Olympics. And uh, what you're looking at is a series of masts, they're about 30 meters tall, and then the top couple, like three meters, is uh, or four meters is actually a stainless steel top that's misting. And then there's a device over here, which I'll show you in a minute. But uh, taking this sort of principle of what happens when you have uh, moisture in the air, we have a lot of these beautiful buildings in New York, uh, as, as you do here. And then so the tops of the buildings are lit at night. Uh, and you don't realize uh, how much light is being emanated from that top of the building until you have these days when the fog comes in or there's more moisture in the air, then all of a sudden 
that source of light, which is the top of the building, it might illuminate you know, like a, quite a broad area of the city. Like it might illuminate like a five or six block area of the whole city with a field of softer light. But taking that principle of the light and the mist, uh, we try to create this bridge, it's a pedestrian bridge, and then it's bisected on a north-south axis by these masts. And then in the distance here is heliostat. So the whole principle is these masts are creating, by taking the water out of this stream, we're, pump, we're filtering the water, pumping it up to the top of the mast, and then misting it. And then the, the mirror in the distance, which is the heliostat, takes the sunlight and projects a beam of sunlight back through the mist. Uh, so you're basically creating a synthetic cloud. So here's a little image of what, uh, what's happening uh, there to the section. But this is the, this is the principle, is that in bright sunlight, how do you actually create light structures in the air overhead that your eye can perceive? Uh, and it's a little bit trickier than it may sound, uh, in the sense that if it was just sunlight, if you're just projecting sunlight back, uh, if this was just a conventional mirror, you actually wouldn't see this. Uh, because you're already under full sunlight and you're never going to overpower that or, or distinguish another field of light from it. But if this is actually a filtration glass, which means that it's allowing all the blue spectrum, you can see the blue there, the blue light is passing through. So it's only reflecting a certain, certain wavelengths of light. So it's sort of reflecting yellow, which we're obviously very sensitive to. And then you can create these forms in space, overhead, middle of the day, you know, using sunlight. So you're just using the same the same source of light, but projecting it back on itself. Uh, and that's the installation of the, uh, the larger mast with the heliostat on top. One of the tops of these masts that creates this uh, synthetic cloud. And then you get these bars of light. What's sort of interesting about this is that, of course, um, depending on the atmospheric conditions, I mean, if it's very humid out, uh, the mist will actually accu will accumulate, will accumulate in the area. Uh, and this beam of light could literally be almost a kilometer long. You'll just see a solid beam of light just moving, like literally for a kilometer out like, into this forest. Uh, and then other times when you have different wind conditions and more uh, incidental conditions, you know, the, 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 the wind might be blowing a different direction and you get this fragmentary chain of light uh, overhead. So it's really a way of just, uh, in this instance, it was the Olympics in Sydney, which was all about reclaiming a toxic landscape, turning it into the Olympic Park, uh, figuring out how to deal with toxic soils, how to deal with water circulation and purification of water. So it was really a, a, a threshold that was all about acknowledging this idea of water vapor going up into the sky, condensing, and coming back down as rain. So it was just a, a means of trying to bring people's attention to what we see every day, which are these clouds up above, and they're always illuminated from above, of course, but here we are trying to illuminate a similar type of thing uh, from a horizontal direction. Uh, and then in the evening, uh, basically an artificial source of light comes on, the mirror sort of reorients itself, and then the, the artificial light then moves through the mist. So that's what you're seeing there, is just an artificial source being projected back through the, uh, uh, through the mist. And that's right around the sunset. Uh, and then a different way of uh, thinking about periscopic use of light at a very different scale uh, is this project in New York. It's uh, the Hearst Building, which is a, a foster tower, uh, the original building down here, uh, built in 1928. The new tower, uh, you know, finished around 2006. Uh, what they did is they basically carved out this whole new building and just saved the uh, the walls around it. So it's basically an entirely uh, open space inside. The new structure of the tower comes down through that. And uh, the original entry is preserved as a historic piece. Uh, and then this original entry, which is relatively small, leads you into a new large atrium space. And this is just a, an image that talks a little bit about what we're trying to do. Like this is from the street, you're in bright sunlight looking into a building, and generally in that sort of situation, you'd be looking into a dark space because uh, it's almost impossible with artificial light sources to overcome the brightness of the light in the street. So your eye actually can't dial down quickly enough to see what's in the building. But what we're doing here is we're basically taking daylight uh, from above the building, allowing it to come in, 
hit a structure and then bounce out. And I'll show you what that, that is. So here it is when you walk into the building. It's a, a very large open atrium space. You have to go up to the third level to get the new elevator, the new core elevator here. Uh, so you have to transverse these escalators uh, to get to the elevators. But up above here is a large public dining area, uh, gallery and uh, cafeteria for the workers in the building. Uh, a building like this has about 4,500 people in it. So you have a fairly active uh, flow of people all day long going in and out of the building. Uh, and what we did is working uh, on building these large clerestory windows up above here and skylights over here. So all the way around that space uh, is a series of uh, skylights and clerestories that let the sunlight come in. Uh, and this is basically the principle of what we're trying to do. Uh, these are the, a section of these glass castings. Uh, they're, they're large castings. Uh, they're about you know, not quite two meters, about a meter and a half long, uh, out of uh, clear glass. Uh, basically, they are, act as a prism where when you're looking into it, or I should say this is start with the light, the light comes down, passes through the water that's running over it, hits the back surface of the glass, which is actually clear, but it bounces the light back to your eye. The back of this acts as a mirror, you know, it's clear glass, so it functions as a true prism. But here's the section through it, so on one hand, large clear story, large skylight, all that daylight comes into this space, it hits the slope surface and it bounces out to your eye. So when you're looking in, you're actually looking out. That's the whole principle. And simultaneously, uh, we're taking the rainwater from the top of the building, you know, which is like 50 stories up, uh, taking that rainwater, bringing it down, and then behind this, there's actually a room back here where we're then storing the water, filtering it, and chilling it. And then that cold water is allowed to run over this surface, and it becomes the cooling system uh, for the public atrium space. So it's actually circulating very cool water in the summer. Uh, and uh, of course what happens when you have high humidity like we have in New York, uh, in the summer the warm, humid air condenses on the cold water on the fountain. So you're actually dehumidifying the space. That's providing some cooling, but the water is also chilled, so it provides uh, just in terms of convection, whoops, convection of quality of cooling. And uh, just how these things are made, this is a, a mold, uh, a mold made out of graphite, machine graphite. Uh, it has a very active texture on this side and a smoother texture on that side. Uh, you're actually flipping that piece over. You're looking at, this is the bottom of the mold, but it's actually the face of the final piece. Uh, the glass is sort of poured in. Uh, you end up with these large castings. The men sort of install the castings on a predetermined structural system. And you can see there's nothing really behind the glass. It's just structure, but your eye actually, just due to the optics of the glass, can't see through it even though it's clear. You're seeing the back surface of the glass, and due to the, due to the indices of refraction, your eye goes back up through it. So it's acting as a periscope. Uh, and then this is the space uh, in there. So it, it's a sense, again, something where you have a large population of people moving through the building every day. Uh, and this is a moment in time when you enter the building uh, where there's a sense of, I think, a little bit of uh, repose and calmness, quietness. You sort of move up through it. You have the sound of water rushing over the surface. Uh, so it's doing multiple things. It's like the sound of the water is sort of, sort of, you know, sort of damping the other noises you would typically get in a large open atrium space. Uh, you have the cooling properties, obviously you have the visual properties or aesthetic properties. So it's something we try to do on a lot of projects where it's not exclusively one thing. You try to deal with other, what we call performative issues, like things that need to be dealt with in the building uh, simultaneously uh, with, with one of these works. And uh, this project uh, uh, is this one right here. I, I was going to show that one, that tower, but this, 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 this one is uh, called Fulton Center. And it's a, uh, a transit center that was built <clears throat> in the last few years. It opened about two years ago. And uh, it's on Broadway. These are the original drawings uh, for, for our competition entry for the project. These are subway systems. These are tunnels, tunnels below the street, right? Uh, which we have a whole uh, sort of messy network in New York City of these tunnels because uh, all of our subways originally were privately owned by different owners. 
uh, and they were all sort of trying to satisfy their own customers without really caring about the customer on the train a block away. Uh, and they were trains, they were all above the street originally, and then they dug them down, buried them in the street. Uh, so one of the biggest predicaments we have in New York is we have very, very old infrastructure, and it's quite difficult to uh, navigate between different subway lines, particularly when you come downtown, where this is. You have a lot of subway lines running north-south that get very close to each other, but you can't connect to the east-west. So this whole project was about, uh, primarily was underground, it was more about tunneling underground. And then we were suggesting using daylight and all of the subway entries, which, which you've done here, uh, certainly. And then we were sort of primarily focused on this large roof structure uh, overhead uh, that would bring more light. You're in the density of Manhattan, you're in a relatively low building, uh, and how do you sort of maximize the amount of light coming into the building? So uh, we're working on this roofing system. These are the types of models. We do a lot of models in the actual materials. So uh, this final project was done in an optical aluminum, so the model is done in the same material. Uh, and this is doing tests uh, of the system. And uh, this also has to perform a couple things at once. One is daylight down below, but the other is that behind the structure is all the uh, smoke evacuation equipment for the subway system. So the panels have to be perforated at a very specific uh, porosity to allow smoke to move through it. Uh, and then this is the space, and you're just seeing the beginning of how, how, this, is, uh, how this is being uh, sort of installed, and that system up above here is tensioned down to this level, the ground level, and then these panels are being applied. But this little uh, video shows some of the men installing the panels, and then uh, it basically arrives on site as a, uh, a net. It's actually a pre-designed, pre pre-engineered net, cable net, which we do a lot of these projects using cable systems. Uh, the cable system is then installed, uh, at the top and tension down and the men start filling in the panels uh, to do it and you end up with a, a device which is uh, obviously brings in a great deal of daylight but uh, I think uh, the more important aspect of this and this again comes back to cinematic qualities of daylight <clears throat> is what you're looking at here and you see this in the morning and then the late afternoon, you can't, you can't really see this in the middle of the day because there's too much light coming in. What's happening is the shape, the shape is actually, it's called a toroid. It's actually sort of a double curved surface. Uh, so what's happening when you look, when I'm looking at that area right there, it's actually curving away from me. It's curving in, out, in. When I look at that, I'm actually looking at the sky way back over here. It's a way of... It's a way of saying that if you have a skylight in a building, say to take a typical skylight, your view of the sky is strictly through that skylight. But if you actually shape the aperture on the inside, you're actually looking at the aperture through at a very different angle. So you, you've actually broadened the view angle of light being brought into the space. So you've literally 10, 20 fold, you're bringing in more light than you ever would have done just with a skylight. But more importantly, in this instance, is how that light you're bringing in is also an image. So you're actually folding, folding the image of the sky overhead down into the building, and, it, and it's a live image of the sky. Uh, and it's, uh, it, you know, it's just an optical, very simple optical principle. Uh, but, it, but it's a way where people, you know, people are there at the right time of day, you can see the sun, you know, the late afternoon sunset, the whole thing goes you know, sort of orange. And, you see different things in it, but it's, a, it's again a way of trying to register the variabilities of light that are around us, but in a city, you obviously don't often let yourself acknowledge those qualities of light. So a lot of the projects are about how, how to make people more aware of those types of things. And then other, uh, other projects of ours, I should say, that we're very, uh, very, very, very much involved in like how do people re-engage with nature. I mean, that, that's underlying our work. That's what it's about. It's about how, how to get people to understand that there are qualities of nature which we collectively appreciate uh, and wish we had more of uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. How do you find ways of sort of reconnecting people to a shared 
resource around us, or, and or how, how do we acknowledge that there's qualities of nature in an urban environment? So that last project is trying to do that. It's trying to sort of highlight or focus your attention on the sky above, which you might not look at if you had to look up through all these very tall buildings. And this particular project is, is different, but uh, nonetheless, it sort of is, again, how, how do you let, uh, let qualities of nature become the driving design factor in a project. So this is a Stanford University, uh, and we have these very, these are the mountains, the Pacific Ocean is right on the other side. You come over the mountains to Palo Alto, uh, and you get these wonderful sort of uh, weather conditions because of San Francisco Bay, where you get fogs and low clouds that hang in the redwood trees. Uh, so you often have this sort of quality of a very soft, organic shape sort of floating over the landscape. And then we were asked to uh, work on this uh, outdoor amphitheater, uh, which is uh, right in the middle of the campus. It was designed in 1930. Uh, and it's where there were, back in the 60s, like a lot of the great rock concerts with Janis Joplin and the Doors and all those guys played here. Uh, so it had a uh, quite a notorious history uh, for the campus. Uh, but over the years, it became neglected in terms of usage because it didn't really uh, adapt to accessibility. It's like a little mound, in the, like a small forest around it. And most people today actually don't even know this exists. They all sort of walk around here and you just assume there's whatever, there's nothing there, there's nothing in this space. But uh, the project was all about redoing all the stages and, and, and how you access this for trucks and all of that, but also, and more importantly from our perspective, was about how you would cover this. And you might not think you need cover in California uh, for protection, but it's, uh, it does rain in California occasionally. Uh, and you, you do get relatively cold wind, weather in the winter and uh, fogs and, and things of that sort. So we, uh, we took off on a design idea uh, for this bowl, it's actually this natural shaped bowl of sort of a new stage area, a new sort of space for special events uh, there. This is the audience. It seats about 8,000 people. And then again, using a cable net, very similar to that net we showed you for that previous project, a larger scale cable net used for this roofing system uh, supported by a small mass that keep the whole structure below the height of the trees, basically. And then this very sort of organic shape that complements the bowl shape uh, and then just the analyses of how it, uh, by installing this structure, uh, because the trees around it are basically, it's cool beneath the trees, uh, and you get a natural flow. We're trying to create a shape for the roof. It creates a flow of air that moves up through this. So you, by installing the roof, you can actually sort of accelerate the movement of the air uh, through the bowl to cool it. Uh, and then. Uh, the uh, sort of an image of what that's like, and then uh, a view of it when it's uh, retracted. Actually, this is a deployable uh, roofing system. But it's, uh, again, just trying to talk about how you, uh, in this case, work outdoors uh, in a very beautiful environment, and then create something that touches the environment very lightly, uh, and in some ways complements the qualities of spatial qualities and sort of natural qualities of the space. Uh, and uh, the way we were thinking of it a lot, a lot, because we're lower than the tops of the trees, is when the fabric sort of deploys along the cable nets. Uh, the fabric actually comes out, as you'll see, and then sort of is pulled taut uh, over the structure. It has these uh, reflectors on the top of the cables that reflect north light when it's retracted. But then as the fabric comes out, I, th I think what's sort of interesting about it is that when the fabric is out, the actual shadow of the trees falls on the fabric. So you're in a space uh, outdoors and protected, but it really feels more like a very lightweight uh, like a little tent or canopy. Uh, so below that space, you have this wonderful uh, sense of being in that, that area. So it's working with light in a different way. Uh, as I said, there were some reflectors on the top of the structure. When you're sitting in the audience here, those reflectors, as you can see here, are still reflecting north light back. You can sort of have that reading of uh, structure in there. So sometimes the projects are not, uh, not uh, you know, not in urban situations, but they're actually working like the one in Sydney, trying to work outdoors and how you work with daylight. 
and uh, this particular project is in uh, uh, Jerusalem, and it's a, a, a museum, it's actually the National Museum, it's sort of a national landmark uh, in Israel, designed by a fellow named Alfred Mansfeld, who was at the Bauhaus, uh, and uh, emigrated to Israel in the, uh, uh, after the war, just before the war, and uh, it was built in the early 60s, and it actually follows, uh, those of you who are architects, uh, it follows some theoretical work that was uh, discussed at that time in the early SIAM conferences in the early 50s uh, about what's called non-hierarchical construction where uh, the buildings are all oriented. In some respects, they uh, are called map buildings. In some ways, they represent what might be a, 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 an indigenous sort of Arab village on a hilltop, but they're basically a series of volumes that are all interconnected that all relate to the landscape at the top of this mountain, this little hill, which is called the Hill of Tranquility. So the original buildings, gallery buildings, sort of step up through here. That was a temporary building that we took down. The original gallery spaces here, library. And the, these, interestingly enough, uh, uh, were actually galleries that were added in 1970, I think 78 or 79. And they were done by uh, Jurgen Bowe, who did uh, Louisiana, the Louisiana Museum. Uh, but what happens with many projects and many build, many buildings of this period, or even buildings that have been around for only 20 years, uh, oftentimes accommodation for new exhibition or circulation or visitor experience is completely changed, or the museum hasn't really uh, maintained the buildings, or they've added things in sort of in a, in a haphazard way. So a lot of this project was taking this campus as it was when we first got the project, which was around 2004, and our charge was to replan the campus, uh, particularly from the point of view of renovating all the galleries, but also how do we create a new experience for people to uh, move through this landscape, which is a very beautiful Mediterranean landscape. And this museum from this location, this is the original entry building, and an original building down here, which we took down. But these, uh, these are about, uh, about 50 feet, meaning about, uh, what are about 15 meters uh, elevation change just within that campus. So uh, what you had to do was walk up through here, which was fine if you were fit and capable, and then the entry was way over here. So you'd enter, walk all the way up, go into that entry, go down, and then you come all the way back to these galleries underground. Uh, and uh, they had a road right here that you see that went right through the middle of the campus. Garbage collection here. They would drive elderly or handicapped people up to the entry here. So they, they basically subdivided the campus. And this is a, this is a series of a little building by uh, Frederick Kiesler. This houses all of the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, this is a garden by Isamo Noguchi uh, here. You know, it has a beautiful James Terrell piece. You know, Richard Serra has all the great sculptors work in here, and then the museum complex. There's really three things. There's a garden, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the museum. And the, the roads, and sort of what had been happening over the years, the landscape was being pushed further away from the original buildings. And I think originally, there was a very much more intimate connection between uh, the buildings and landscape. Uh, so our, our main, our main uh, work to begin with was this. I mean, we're taking taking spaces that were being <coughs> underutilized up in the main museum here, like they had a bookstore, a cafe up here. We took all of those elements out of the original core of the museum. They could be brought down to the beginning. So this is their the entry, this is like a new restaurant, new security entry, new bookstore, and then renovated and, and, and added new galleries up above there. So our work is really these three new buildings, whole new passageway, a below ground tunnel, a new building inserted in the center of the campus, and then the renovation of the galleries uh, in the campus itself. So it's about, uh, let's see, it would be about uh, yeah, 10,000 square meters of new exhibition, new construction, about 10,000 meters of, uh, uh, of, of, uh, of renovation. So that's that. So this is uh, basically carving right up through the center of the campus, like digging a tunnel or taking out that road uh, and cutting up through the center of the campus to put in a uh, tunnel, and this is basically what's in that excavated space that you just saw. Uh, and it's a tunnel that uh, at this end, we, we call it the root of, root of passage, actually. We don't refer to it as a tunnel, it's a root of passage. It's a way of, to walk up through, but we want you to always feel connected to the landscape. 
Uh, so at this point, you're maybe about five meters underground, uh, and then as you get up here, you're about 15 meters underground. So it's quite a, this is all for accessibility, it's air conditioned, you can come in there, and it's a little over, it's about 120 meters long, uh, going up the hill through that area. But the whole working with daylight is how, how to manage what appears to be a relatively even quality of light and connectivity to the landscape, even though you're far below ground. So that, that was sort of the challenge uh, in this particular part of the museum. And then that's an Olafur Eliasson uh, painting at the top there that leads you into the new museum entry buildings. The original buildings, very beautiful, small scale, fantastic architecture, uh, really amazing original buildings. And uh, uh, now talking about daylight, this is working in Israel. So you're in a very, very intense uh, mid -east, Middle Eastern quality of light. Uh, we wanted to distinguish all of the new buildings by being entirely made out of glass. Uh, and the reason for that is really twofold. One, one is the original buildings that I just showed you uh, are basically opaque. They only have a very small gun slot window, very dark glass around the top, and then facing north, uh, a little bit deeper window. So that's how they dealt with the light. The very top of these buildings, a little gun slots, a very little light. I mean, plenty of light getting in, actually, but nonetheless, no views out. Very disorienting when you move through the building. You're not connected to the landscape at all visually. So the new buildings are trying to do this, which is all glass construction, literally, floor to ceiling, all glass for all the new buildings. It's not even insulated glass. It's just monolithic, laminated glass. But all of the buildings are entirely shaded by a custom, sort of a, a shading system that we designed. So you have no uh, thermal heat gain from the sun. There's no time of the year the direct sun gets into any of these buildings. So therefore you can work with glass. And uh, these, these are just early mock-ups of uh, different shapes uh, for the, uh, sort of for these foils that are, that are shading the buildings. And what you're looking at, this one, if you tip this up on its end, that would be the upper portion that's down. Uh, this is perpendicular to the ground plane here. Uh, this would be our east-west louver, uh, and this is our north-south louver. Uh, so the difference of the two, as you well know, is that uh, we're on a hill. Uh, we have absolutely horizontal light. We have sunset and sunrise coming in directly on the buildings at the top of the hill. So we actually have to have 100% shading, meaning that there's no way for light to get directly in. Uh, and then the north-south uh, louver, which is this one, this is the vertical surface here, is relatively broadly spaced open, so you have great visibility through it. And the main axis of the museum is on north-south axis, so all the visibility is into the buildings, either entering the museum or coming out of the buildings. And the point of doing this was to make sure that when people were in this vicinity, uh, in Jerusalem, which is right near the Parliament building and the Supreme Court building, a very public area, a big botanical garden, that you would realize the museum was open. Because before, with the original buildings, which were all concrete, never any idea if the museum was open or anybody in there or what was going on. Like totally uh, you know, mute as a building, that did not connected to the landscape, not connected to the public view. And basically, you can see what happens. The light, the intensity of the light is coming. It's being completely stopped by this overlapping one foil to the next foil. But a portion of the light is hitting this scoop, and then the scoop is bouncing the light up above it. So what you're doing is it's a, on the one side of the wall, it's a shading device, but on the other side of the very same piece is actually the lighting device. So it's, a, it's, it's shading the building and then providing indirect lighting. So that, that's the whole principle here. How does one system do both things. And uh, this is uh, obviously the intensity of light on the outside of the building. This is what you get on the inside. Like very soft lights are distributed over a broad surface. And in, 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 in Jerusalem, this is, that's plenty of light. It's like beautifully lit on the interior of the buildings. But more importantly is this, what you see the phenomenon here, which is if there are any trees outside or people or any movement or color, basically that information is transmitted through an opaque wall. So the wall is opaque virtually, but you're getting this quality. You'll, you'll see shadow moving here and uh, you know, color and the 
trees, you've got the green quality of the trees. It's, it's very interesting. It's like not a view at all, but fragments of the information or enough fragments of the information are there for you to sort of your mind sort of thinks you're looking at you know, what's outside. Uh, and then this is just how they're made. You know, it's just a, the dye, the dye for the extrusion. That's, that's the north-south ones, uh, north-south ones here, east-west ones there. Uh, and then they, they look like this. So north-south, you can look through it. They capture, like this is from the outside. You would almost have the exact same shape on the inside. You'd see the shadow of the tree on the inside uh, as well. And this is on the north-south axis leading up to uh, the Spanish Kapoor piece up above here. But you come up, you can see perfectly well in the buildings. These are open. The other reason for moving all these buildings down to the front of the museum is they could stay open all the time. The museum's closed, the bookstore, restaurants, all those things stay open as part of a uh, sort of community uh, dining area. But here's the system. Uh, so all glass buildings, and then the shading system is sometimes closer to the glass, and other times it's further away from the glass. But we use it to sort of create uh, shaded walkways and make it very uh, comfortable and inviting for people to move through the campus without actually having to go out into uh, the intensity of the daylight outside. So that's the type of view you get through the shading systems. Uh, and there are the glass wall systems of the whole, the whole museum. So, <clears throat> so very interesting project. We've done some other work in Lebanon for the American University of Beirut. We did uh, uh, several buildings for their campus. But trying to work in those environments and try to understand uh, the qualities of light. And what's, what's interesting about Jerusalem is uh, if, if you arrive, say, in Tel Aviv, and then you go up to Jerusalem, Jerusalem's at a very, very high point, very high points on Earth on a ridge line of mountains that run literally down into the Sudan and they come up right into Europe. And uh, uh, running through that center part of Lebanon and Israel, it's an incredible migratory path for birds from Africa into Europe. They come right up this mountain range. And the other thing that's quite amazing about it is that on the uh, eastern or the western side of that ridge, going back down towards the Mediterranean from Jerusalem, you have really a Mediterranean environment, very beautiful air, warm, moist air, great sun, just like you're in Greece or you know, whatever, southern Italy or Sicily or something like that, very beautiful climate. But immediately at the top of that ridge in Jerusalem, you look down to the east and it drops down to the Dead Sea. So you're going down below sea level and it's just desert as far as you can see. So it's an amazing climatic uh, boundary. And what that does to daylight is remarkable. I mean, you have the really moist quality of the air sometimes in, in Israel, and the light is really present and really, really beautiful and rich uh, and powerful. Uh, and then all of a sudden, and like this, and then all of a sudden, the whole sky will go totally orange with sand and dust. And as soon as the winds come out of the east, it's just like the whole sky goes totally, you know, red or orange almost, and you get this really solid, you know, probably not so healthy quality of air. It's not pollution, it's just dust in the air. And then the next day you'll have, you know, uh, you know, eight, seven inch of dust everywhere over the city. But that, that sort of transformation of light, uh, it's really remarkable. And I, you know, I think some of these uh, sort of environmental qualities that are so extraordinary there are really what have made that city be such a, an extraordinary loci for that part of the world for so many, you know, so many thousands of years. A very wonderful place to work. This is going into that passageway. Again, trying to keep the individual connected to nature always when you're moving through the landscape. And moving, even moving through the buildings, there's always a sense of being connected to nature. So entering that tunnel, uh, you come through the shaded areas and then you enter into that tunnel space, moving up through it, uh, and then uh, popping into that building at the top. So this is where you can sort of see the Depth. That's that's ground level up there, uh, so that's shading the west light coming in. That's that, that shading system. So that's the level of light you're getting with 100% shading, basically. Still plenty of light, uh, but this is how far underground you are. So that's that's ground level. So you have people right up, walking right up there, uh, but you feel like you're under. You feel like you're still. These are like very narrow courtyards that are cut down through the landscape to bring in light and make that whole passageway feel like you're, you're never away from the landscape, never away from uh, the outdoors of the building. And then at nighttime, the, 
the lighting system that you just saw in that below ground passage is, is this uh, water element, it's actually a spring that sort of runs water down through the campus. And uh, in, in the daytime, the sunlight obviously goes right through that. That's just cast glass. Uh, and that's, that's where you're like maybe uh, 20, 20, not 20, but you're like 15 meters underground from there. People are walking you know, way down here uh, underground. But the, at daytime, the sun comes down and illuminates that whole long passageway. And at nighttime, this is just sort of the light from that passageway sort of emanating back up into the landscape. So, very fun project. And I, I'll, I'll just go quickly here, but this is a, a project that's just under construction right now, but it's a, a quite an interesting project in the sense that it's a, a building done by a, a Aero Saarinen uh, back in uh, 1963, and uh, it's on the Mississippi River and uh, it's a competition that we've won uh, several years ago uh, with a landscape architect. And uh, this, is, this is what's called uh, the Jefferson National uh, Expansion Memorial. Jefferson National Expansion Memorial. So it's a, it's a memorial to Thomas Jefferson, you know, one of our early presidents who wrote the Constitution. Uh, and he was instrumental in terms of uh, negotiating with the French to buy the western part of the United States, negotiating with the Russians to buy Alaska, and basically allow the United States to uh, extend from uh, the Atlantic to the Pacific. So he had a very, uh, very sort of high-minded philosophical idea about this this movement in the West, uh, and this is sort of a sort of a, 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 a sort of tribute to that, or a memorial or a museum for that purpose. So you've all probably seen this, which I'll show you in a moment, which is the arch, uh, St. Louis Arch. Uh, but our, our, our partner is doing all the landscape renovations, uh, which were done by uh, one of the great landscape designers of the 20th century, a guy named Daniel Kiley. Really extraordinary. He did all the work with Mies van der Rohe and Iampe, almost every famous architect you can name. He did the, all their work. Uh, and what we're, our job was coming back into this landscape and covering this highway that's here, covering the highway that always separated this park from downtown, renovating that park, renovating this courthouse, and then a new park. So we're, we're, we're less involved in the parks, we're more involved in the renovation, the bridging, and then this arch, and, and more importantly, a museum. There's actually an existing museum underground here, and then we're doubling the size of that and then expanding it. So it gives you a little sense, that's the Mississippi River, uh, right there, and uh, maybe you've probably heard about uh, Lewis and Clark, our famous explorers who left left from here, and then they went by a canoe uh, with Indians and went all the way out to the mouth of the Columbia River, which is quite an extraordinary story. Uh, but anyway, here's the uh, sectional look at that. Here's the river, Mississippi River. This is the arch. Uh, the original museum is right here underground. Uh, and the original museum was always accessed by these ramps under the arch, and you would go down into this museum, uh, and there's a little ride that takes you up the arch and down the arch. Uh, so we're expanding the museum and then providing a new entry here, covering the highway and then this park here. So it's basically trying to make this urban connection, which has never been there before, connecting the city to the park, connecting the city to the river, all of these things. And what's, what's important about this is uh, there are about three million people that come to visit this every year, the Arch, but very few of them ever go into the city of St. Louis. They usually come into town, come into town, and then they uh, basically leave town immediately after. So this is the, that's the part of that project. So this is the covering the highway here, the bridge, and then our new entry. And what was what's sort of interesting about this, uh, <clears throat> just sort of architecturally and, and uh, just in terms of design issues, is it's a listed landscape, meaning that all of the topography is listed, meaning that you can't disturb it. Uh, and then the arch and all of those parts are obviously national landmarks, and you can't disturb those. So. This whole idea of expanding the museum is sliding under this, this, this berm with a new entry.
country, then going down and sort of creating this new spaces underground. Uh, so that's sort of as it was. That's the highway separating at the old park. And this is long, this is an old rendering, but that's, that's the idea how you can't call that together. Uh, early models sort of showing what that is. Uh, and then this is a, actually a shot from the top of the arch looking straight down. It's a pretty tall structure, actually. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really remarkable how the geometry of this shape, uh, it's very unusual. It's a tetrahedral, right, it's a prism, and then it's tapering as it goes up. It's just amazing how it performs with light. So you're looking down at the shadow, there's a shadow of the arch. And this is just as we began uncovering, we had to sort of dig out the whole original museum, which has been there for you know, 50 years, uh, dig it all out from underground, uh, re-roof it, re-waterproof it, re-bury it, all of those things. And then these are just some very early studies of the shadow of the arch, how the shadow of the arch goes across the Mississippi River uh, different times of the day, different times of the year, uh, how, how it sort of has this way to touch a very broad part of the surrounding environment uh, with its presence in terms of the shadow and looking at that in different ways as well. Um, so what we're trying to do here is uh, create an entry that will feel like it's daylit even though we were not allowed to put any skylights into the landscape. So we worked on uh, obviously the whole excavation of the site now for not so long ago. So the original museum's been already recovered and reburied. New structure, this is the new entry, the highway's covered. All of this is starting to sort of come into play now. Uh, and the new entry uh, that brings you down. What's interesting about the landscape design uh, is how Kylie never never emphasizes the central axes. All of your movements through the landscape are circuitous. You sort of move out, rejoin, move out again, rejoin, move out again. It's all these sort of like parallel, very organic moves through the landscape. So we try to repeat that here. When you come in, you can either circulate out that way or circulate this way. You go in, circulate around, go in, circulate around, go down into this other spaces. So it's a uh, Sort of, sort of coming together right now in terms of uh, construction, but the entrance way. So this is all uh, obviously outdoor space. This is now enclosed. This will be glazed over. You'll come into this space, and then this is all entry eventually. It'll be opened up. It's covered for construction, and then we designed a whole lighting system uh, inside uh, that will sort of carry the sense of light all the way down uh, to connect to the old building. And the way we wanted you to read this entry when you're in the landscape is really just a carved reflection of the sky. So when you're, you're walking in the landscape, you just see this reflection of the sky sort of nested uh, into the landscape. And then you look back, connects you back to the courthouse. Uh, and then it's sort of that project. <laughs>